Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, it is a high and holy privilege to uh, come before you in this way. For us to take the opportunity here on Good Friday to contemplate the profound nature of what God did through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. We know that uh, it is through the cross that we are able to know and experience God's forgiveness. God offers his son. He, uh, he uh, shares his son in, in all love so that we might be drawn closer to him, that we might be once and for all reconciled with him. As stated in 1 Timothy 1.15, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And indeed, Christ has come. His full purpose was to draw us closer to God and for us to be in relationship with him now and for all eternity. And it is at the intersection of the cross that all of that is made possible. So I encourage you as you worship uh, uh, here on uh, Good Friday, that you take the opportunity to contemplate the profound thing that God has done, that you let the Spirit move, and as the Spirit moves in your heart and soul, may you find yourself drawn closer to the cross, and as you're drawn closer to the cross, may you find yourself drawn closer to God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come around the cross as we uh, contemplate your great work through Christ. May we know full well of your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you for Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the deep love that you th show through him as we uh, share passages of Scripture from the Passion narrative, as we consider the last week of Christ's life, and in particular, all that took place on the cross, may it be that our hearts are illumined and that we know full well that you sent your Son to die in order for us to be forgiven. So bless us as we worship you. And in this worship, may everything that we say, everything that we do, everything that uh, emanates from our hearts, may it be pleasing in your sight. This prayer we make in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's share together in this song. In that old rugged cross, 
Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to that old rugged I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish. So often on Good Friday, there is um, opportunity taken for worship called uh, Tenebrae. Tenebrae services have, uh, have, have stretched since the 12th century A.D. They have been services of, of darkness. Scriptures have been uh, read with plenty of time for contemplation. And as the scriptures are read, uh, lights are extinguished, where at the end there is a uh, a sense of the, of the darkness and foreboding that uh, surrounded the cross. And as a conclusion to that uh, time of, uh, of tenebrae, uh, the very light of, of Christ is extinguished. The Christ candle itself uh, is snuffed, symbolizing the, the fact that uh, Christ's life was given so that we uh, might uh, clearly uh, clearly know and experience the forgiveness that God offers through his son. And so tonight we share in a set of scriptures that recount the events in and around Christ's passion on the cross. And as those passages of scripture are read, I encourage you to listen intently, to let the scripture speak let the Spirit uh, move to the end that uh, you are uh, uh, drawn uh, closer to Christ and that you find yourself uh, more, uh, very much more so in the scene of the crucifixion of Christ. We're thankful for Don and Leanne, uh, for Jack and Charlie Dugan, for their willingness to, uh, to, to participate in tonight's service. So let's listen to God's Word. And as we uh, listen to God's word, may we find ourselves responding with hearts that are open, hearts that are faithful, hearts that are ready to, to move closer and closer to the profound truth that is Christ on the cross and what it means for each of us and for the world. May God bless us all. Jesus went forth with his disciples across the Kindron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, procuring a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, 
I told you that I am he. So, if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Judean authorities seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the religious authorities that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. The high priest questioned, then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jewish people come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early. They themselves did not enter the headquarters, so that they might not be defiled, but might eat Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man was not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The religious authorities said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to, sh to show by what death he was to die. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The religious authorities answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was more afraid. He entered the headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to, Pilate sought to release him. But the religious authorities cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out 
and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the religious authorities, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And they handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Judeans read this title. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The Jewish chief priests then said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the religious authorities asked Pilate, that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it had borne witness, his testimony is true, And he knows that he tells the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Friends, it is good to be with you in this way. I'll be sharing just a short meditation from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. Hear the word of the Lord. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. 
but all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The word of the Lord. So crucifixion was recognized as the most horrific type of death meant for the most horrible, worst kind of criminal. Not only was it meant to cause pain in the vilest way physically, but also emotionally and mentally through mocking, humiliation, and time. You see, crucifixion was not a fast process. It took hours for death to be achieved. And then even after the criminal hanging on that cross died, sometimes, actually most of the time, their body was left there to rot. Now, each gospel has their own unique way of sharing this this crucifixion scene of Jesus, and tonight we read Luke's. And I want to spend some time talking about the characters that Luke includes. First were the criminals, those who would hang on either side with Jesus, one who mocked him and one who defended him. Then we had the soldiers, the soldiers who cast lots to find out which one would get the clothing, which is quite an ironic act, being since casting lots is a way of letting God make the decision. And then these soldiers were also the same ones who mocked Jesus, saying, if you truly are the Messiah, if you are the Son of God, save yourself. And then there were the people who gathered, those who were there just to watch. You see, crucifixion was the original blood sport, much like we think of with the gladiator games in the Roman times. Both were quite the spectacle and social gathering. It was the place to be, per se. And most of these people, more than likely, didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But there were the acquaintances there that did. Those who were closest to Jesus, including his mother and other women from Galilee, who had gathered hoping what was about to happen wouldn't happen. Now let's turn our focus to Jesus for just a moment. Jesus had been beaten and mocked. His suffering, his pain, his agony exploited for entertainment. Now, I'm sure spectators may have thought that Jesus was being put in his place. I'm sure some thought maybe Jesus would give in and admit that everything he had said, everything he had done was just for show. Maybe he would even ask for forgiveness from the people for doing what he had done and saying what he had said. But that's not what happened at all, as we know. Earlier in verse 34 in Luke Jesus pleads with the Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And then Jesus' last act wasn't one of needing approval of men, but of surrender, of humility. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. His last act was on purpose, in line and in submission of his Father's will, just like his whole life had been. The entire show wasn't one of regret or shame, but of humility, of grace, of forgiveness. And then Jesus takes his last breath. And that's when Luke presents a shift in the scene, a shift in these characters. The centurion, a commander of the Roman army, who declared, certainly this man was innocent. Spectators left the scene who had came to watch the show. They left mourning, beating their chest, a show of reverence and loss and sorrow. Those who knew him stood at a distance, gazing at the foot of the cross upon the man they loved, whom they had followed, the man who had loved them in return. Hatefulness, arrogance, and cruelty transformed to grief, reverence, and worship. Worship through actions and responses that declared the world had just lost the best hope it had. Worship that poured out the grief that they hadn't done more. Worship of regret that they hadn't believed sooner. Worship of immense pain of the loss of a friend, a man whom they believed was God. They worshiped with all they had to offer, and all they had to offer was their loss. If there is ever a season of loss that we can understand, friends, we are all in that season right now together. We are all sharing some type of loss. Losses that go from being extreme to maybe not so extreme. Loss of jobs, loss of economic stability, loss of our freedom of security, loss of normalcy, perhaps even loss of a loved one. And while we are an Easter people, 
and Sunday is coming, today is Friday. And yes, we have hope and we have assurance of God's presence with us right now. But I believe Luke wants us to sit with these people in this narrative that we read tonight. The people who weren't sure of God's presence. Those who were mourning the loss of the man they believed to be the Savior. The people who were asking while gazing upon the cross, why? But not receiving an answer. It is a time of lament, to grieve, to express our sorrow, to mourn. To sit with the Father, the Father who lost his Son so that the cross would be transformed from fear to freedom. You see, crucifixion was meant to deter crime through means of fear. But Jesus' crucifixion was meant to deter fear through means of freedom. Jesus breathed his last words, trusting that his Father would receive him. And in his death, he secured the freedom for us to do that as well. The veil is torn. We have a direct line to God now, just as Jesus did then. And Jesus offered all that he could in that moment to his Father, which was his spirit that had been broken, that was weak, that had suffered and been torn down. And while we rejoice in the freedom that we have found because of the cross, because of the sacrifice Jesus made for us, we mourn with the Father in the loss of his Son. We mourn the death of our Savior, that he had to die in order that we may know that freedom. It's much easier to look past it, to avoid it, to skip over Good Friday and jump right to Sunday. We're not the best at dealing with hard things and pain. But so much of the Bible encourages us to do otherwise. For instance, in Ecclesiastes 3-4, it says, There is a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Now is our time to mourn. And we mourn with the Father, trusting that he is here with us. Trusting that he will accept all the worship that we have to offer him, even if that worship doesn't seem like enough. Even if all we have to offer is our loss. Please pray with me. Father, we cry out to you tonight, remembering the great loss your son suffered for our freedom. We offer what we have, our hurt, our fear, our pain, our grief, knowing that you are with us, trusting in your goodness, believing in your love for us, assured that though we are vulnerable, we can find healing in your comfort, in your peace, in your will. Thank you for the great gift of Jesus. Thank you for the cross. We praise you for the freedom we have found in him. We praise you and pray these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the religious authorities, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus And Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation... As the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there.
in the side. 